today as we come to the table. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Using an agricultural analogy that they would understand to speak about his picture of him dying and resurrecting, even as you take a seed, plant it in the ground, the seed dies, it sprouts new life and brings forth a crop. He says, the same thing is true of me. I'm going to die. I'm going to be put in the ground, in a tomb, so to speak, for three days and three nights, but my death will be brought back to new life. And because of my new life that springs from my roots of death and, and coming back to life and resurrection, there'll be a whole harvest that'll come in with other believers following me. When Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, it was an act akin to a king riding into his city in peaceful triumph. He was coming into the city, though, knowing that only a few days later, he would be undergoing the intense pain and anguish of dying on the cross for us. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. As Pastor Mark will point out in today's message, Jesus' death on the cross wasn't just for the Jews. It was sort of like a world premiere for him. Now, maybe we would still know about him if it weren't for this act, but most likely he wouldn't have had the reach that his death brought because this death was for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, because he bore our sin to reconnect our relationship with God. Now let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John chapter 12 as he continues his message entitled, Jesus's World Premiere. Jesus himself said when he was on the earth, no one has seen the Father but me. That is, there was nobody in heaven yet. So where were they? Where was David? Where were all the believers? Where were they? The Bible says in a supernatural holding tank that was a paradise that the Lord set up that believers would go to. So Lazarus went to this paradise and was temporarily in that paradise for four days. Now he comes back. I'd be saying, what was it like? What did you see? First of all, the hope that he would give people that were afraid of death and saying, it was amazing and you should have seen it, and the colors and the music and the sound, whatever. And well, who was there? Was, there was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Elijah, and they were all there, and they're it's all waiting on us, and it's this glorious place. Imagine the conversations. Now, I don't know what the conversations were. Again, it doesn't tell us. But again, when you think about the draw that this would have been just for Lazarus alone, then imagine all that spreading into Jerusalem and all the gossip and all the talk and saying, yes, and he said this, and he saw them, and this is happening, and whatever. I mean, Jesus was being exalted to the highest point here. And the Jews were being confronted with all the evidence that he was who he said he was. And again, this makes this all the more dramatic as we get to the story. And so it says, now notice this. You, again, you would think... The chief priests and everybody would be saying, well, we need to bow down to him. We need to turn the kingdom over to him. We need to ask him to take over. Look at verse 10. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Not just Jesus. Kill the guy that just raised from the dead. It's like, can I get a break? I just raised from the dead and you're wanting to kill me already? How many times does a guy have to die for you guys to believe? You know, it's like, well, I mean, you wake up and you're like, I'm alive. Kill him. I mean, it would have been awful. Run. You know, I don't know how to, it wasn't that way. But either way, I, I played these out over dramatically in my mind. Um, but either way, it's very ironic that a guy just raised from the dead, they want to kill him again. And he's like, you know, you didn't even give me time to breathe. I think about it, not that I'd want to be killed by someone, but probably Lazarus wouldn't have cared that much. Think about it. I really don't want to go through the whole uh, thing. But apart from that, wow, here I am again. Hi, guys. Just went out to grab something and came right back, you know. And, uh, you know, how'd you do that? Never mind. The Lord will explain it all later. You know, I don't know. But I, I, it wouldn't have been, a, think about Lazarus. He wouldn't have been afraid to die. You know, when you're not afraid to die and you know where you're going, nobody can stop you. If you're here today and you're afraid of death, you can be stopped. And you can be silenced in your testimony and your witness in your life. If you're here today and you don't care whether or not, not that you don't want to live, of course you want to live. 
It's human nature. It's what's built into us. But what I mean is, if you can serve the Lord and there's not a fear of death, well, I may go to a mission trip and catch some disease or I may die. If you don't have a fear of that, nobody can stop you. That's why Paul was unstoppable. Paul said, you know what? It's better for me that I die. It's better for me that I go on to the Father. But you guys need me, so I'm torn. You know, should I desire to stay here or should I desire to go? I don't know, because he'd already seen heaven just like Lazarus. And I can imagine, you know, that whole weeping thing and waiting on Jesus to come and Lazarus dead the first time. Can you imagine when Lazarus died the next time if he died before his sisters? We don't know the order they died in, but you know what? It would have been a lot different situation, wouldn't it? You lucky dog. Because they'd heard all the stories by then. Wow, tell Abraham I said hi. Can't wait to see Isaac and Jacob. Wow. Well, we're going to miss you, but we'll see you soon. And love you, brother. Love you. Can you imagine how different? That's the difference in a believer's death and an unbeliever's death. It's interesting. Just this week, maybe you heard that David Cassidy died. He was the singer for the Partridge Family. Remember the Partridge Family movie? I guess unless you watch late night TV, the young generation won't know who that is. But the Partridge Family, David Cassidy and all this, his daughter was with him this last week when he died. And she said that the last thing that he ever said was, so much wasted time. And then he died. So, how would you like your last words to be so much wasted time? Guys, let, we, let's not let our time be wasted. It's going to be a joyous day when we enter the kingdom, but how much better to take the time we have now and apply it, to use it, to serve the Lord, to be productive for God and the things of the kingdom. And then when we get there, say, you know, we're on our deathbed. Maybe it happens sooner than we think. In my mind, I've always had this, you know, 80-something, 90-something, you know, maybe in the 90s. You know, my granddad lived to the 90s. Um, you know, my, my, both my granddads lived to the 90s. Uh, my dad almost got to 90. You know, we come from a family of long livers. And so I'm thinking, hey, maybe I'll get, you know, to be 90 as well or something like that. But you know what? I never know. And if suddenly I found out something was killing me and I was going to die suddenly, I've had friends in the body of Christ and I'm with them and we're rejoicing. And like in a few months, suddenly they're gone. What if that happens to me? Am I going to be going, am I going to be laying there getting ready to die going, you know what? I wish I had wish I'd been serving. Why didn't I get involved? Why did I waste so much time? Or am I going to be going, you know what? Okay, I didn't get as long as I thought I would get, but I, 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 I applied it. I did something with it. Guys, do something with it. We don't know when our time is up. Apply yourself to the things of God. This is what it's about, serving him. And so they had a motivation to kill him because, again, he was applying what he had left in the Lord and being a testimony and a witness, and everybody knew it. And so their motivation was kill this guy, silence the testimony of Jesus. But there's another motivation here that you might miss if you don't know who the majority of the Sanhedrin and the chief priests were. The majority of the Sanhedrin were what were called Sadducees. Now, the, the, the religious ruling body of the nation, very different than what we have in America. It would be a lot like our Congress today with our president in that you had Pharisees, Sadducees, and a high priest. So the setup was very similar to what we have today. And you'd have the conservative side, the Pharisees, and the liberal side, the Sadducees, and then, of course, the high priest. So the setup is very similar. We can associate to some degree in our mind of how this worked. But the majority of their Congress, because it was a religious and political body, the majority of their Congress was made up of the liberals and or the Sadducees. Now, why is this so important when it came to the fact that Lazarus had raised from the dead? Because you see, the Sadducees had a theology. The conservatives believed all of the Bible and everything it taught. The Pharisees, although they were legalistic, they were closer to what was correct. The Sadducees only believed portions of the Bible. You know, the rest of it, you know, really, you know, man wrote, not whatever, but the first five books. So they believed that. But because of that, they didn't believe in the resurrection problem. Guess what they're facing? Someone who resurrected right there in their hometown, and they're the, they're the ruling party. They're the ones in control. In other words, something that we don't believe in happened right in front of our face. We must stop it now. Isn't that amazing? Rather than going, you know what? Maybe my theology is wrong. Rather than adjusting their theology, they tried to kill what was opposing their theology and still hold fast to it. Listen, guys, sadly, we have a lot of people, even within the church today, that do this. And I'm not saying that I've got everything right in my theology. The Bible says that many of us even, you know, make many mistakes in many areas. But here's the principle that I want you to grasp. Don't ever let your personal theology or the way you were raised in your church or in the Lord interfere with what the Word of God really says. If you come to a place in the Word of God that disagrees with your theology, if you see someone begin to speak in another language that they don't know, if you see a miracle happen right in front of your eyes, if you hear a word of knowledge from someone that tells you something, nobody can know that but God, and you see the gifts operating, well, our church believed the gifts weren't for today, then lay that belief down. It's wrong. Go with what the word of God says. So whatever system you're facing, whatever you're believing, they didn't believe in the resurrection. The resurrection is not true, so we refuse it. Well, it just happened, so you need to change your theology. You can't deny reality. You can, but it's not going to stand. 
And they try to do this. So what's the warning to us? The warning to us is, is let's not try to take our theology, hold so tightly to it that we make the Bible fit it. Let's go to the Bible and say, God, whatever your Bible says, I'm going to change my theology. I will readjust my theology regardless of what my group taught me growing up. What does your word say? And that's what we stand on. That's what they were dealing with here. And so, again, um, verse 11, because of the account of him, many believed of the Jews, and they went away and believed in Jesus. And now we see that finishes up kind of that last story, and we jump really into what the main part of today is, Jesus' world premiere to the Jews. We'll get to his world premiere to the, the Gentiles again in just a moment. But notice this, he first presents himself to the Jews in what theologians call the triumphal entry. Look at verse 12. The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Now again, why? Because he was the famous rabbi that had done all these miracles. Lazarus raised from the dead. They're grabbing these palm branches, which by the way represented to them freedom, and they were under bondage to Rome. So this was this whole symbolism of freedom. And notice what it says. They cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They were crying out prophecy about the Messiah from the Psalms. Now, again, were they crying out because they knew the Psalms prophesied he would he'd be the Messiah? Maybe some of them realized after it began to happen what was going on. But I think this was spontaneous as the Holy Spirit moved in their hearts. They couldn't help themselves. As Jesus presented himself, they just began to, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And God prophesied that's what would happen. And by the way, that's what true worship is. It is a spontaneous response to seeing Jesus for who he really is. And if you're having trouble worshiping, well, I come, but I really have trouble worshiping. Well, then you know what? Say, God, show me Jesus better. Show me Jesus more. Because I can tell you, when I see Jesus, I don't care what the worship team's singing or doing. I'm telling you from personal experience, when I am in tune with Jesus, it doesn't matter to me what they're doing. My eyes are on him, and I'm praising him. And so what we need to pray is, God, help me to see you, because then there's that spontaneous worship and there's that spontaneous praise that happens when they do that. And so they're crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, fulfilling prophecy. And then Jesus, verse 14, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. And now we go back to the Zechariah passage that we read. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming and sitting on a donkey's colt. And his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, note this, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that he had done these things to them. You ever read scripture that you just didn't understand the first time you read it? What does that mean? I don't know. Well, I'll just kind of follow it back here until further notice and I'll wait for God to show me. That's what happened here. They didn't know what was going on. They were going, hey, that's the fulfillment of the Psalms. Hey, that's Zechariah. Hey, they weren't doing it. They didn't get it. Now, they should have, but they didn't. The Bible tells us they didn't know what was going on. It wasn't until after he died and resurrected and the Holy Spirit began to show them. They were like, hey. It says that when he comes in, it'll be on a donkey. He was on a donkey, guys. It says they'll be shouting this. How could we forget this? How did we not recognize this? So don't feel like if you don't understand everything at the first, you're alone because even the disciples didn't. But I love this because as we walk with the Lord over time, he reveals more and more to us over time. I I've shared this with you guys before. I love it because he does that for me when you guys come up with questions. Oftentimes you'll come up and you'll ask a question. And honestly, sometimes I'll hear the question, I don't know the answer. Now, if I don't know the answer and God doesn't tell me, I'm not going to make it up. All right. So I don't go in this big thing where I start making up what the answer is. But at the same time, when you guys come up and ask questions about what's going on, this kind of thing, sometimes you'll ask the question, and as you're asking, I'm thinking, you know what, I don't know that I really know the answer. But before I can even tell you I don't know the answer, guess what happens? God gives me the answer. And so I'm learning with you. I'm hearing it come out of me going, I get it. That's cool. I understand now, Lord. And here's why God's doing that. It's not so much for my sake, although I get to be a beneficiary of that, but because of the position I'm in as your pastor, God wants you to know the answer. So God tells me, and then I can tell you, and you think I'm really smart. See, this is where pride can come in for a pastor. It's like, yeah, well, I answered that great, didn't I? And you're going, I had no clue. No, I know the truth. I don't know this stuff. God shows, if anything comes out that you get an answer for, that God is speaking to you through his word or something else. Even as we're teaching the word of God, God speaks to you guys about things. His spirit does it. And so I love that because, again, it's just, it's, he answers us. He gives us the answers in the time that we need them and where we're going to know them and lets us know. He did the same thing for the disciples. It says, therefore, verse 17, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So they're, they're saying, you know, they saw Lazarus, right? You can't deny this miracle. We saw it. We were there. It happened. And so this puts the religious leaders in even more of a pickle, so to speak. Um, they couldn't deny it. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, 
You see, you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world, or rather, look, the world has gone after him, which means the whole world. The world's gone after him. In other words, they recognized, even Jesus' enemies recognized this was his world premiere. But they still rejected. Amazing. Amazing. But it doesn't stop here because the Lord, again, had to appear first to the Jews. But now four days later, he's going to die on the cross. Remember, they would bring the Passover lamb in. Four days of examining, he would go to the cross or he would be sacrificed on the temple mount. Jesus, being the Passover lamb, came in four days before, riding on a donkey. Everyone examined him for four days throughout the Gospels. As you go back and look chronologically at what happened. And then he was crucified on the cross four days later. So this was the big reveal. This was the world premiere, if you will, for the Jews. But now he's going to make allusion to the world premiere coming four days later for the Gentiles, for you and I, by these Greeks that come to him. Look here at verse uh, 20. What it says. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Now again, why would Greeks or Gentiles come up to worship at the feast? Because although the Jews didn't accept them, there was what was known among the uh, Gentiles and among the Jews as God-fearers. And so if there were any Gentiles who believed in the God of the Bible, who believed in the God of the Jews, he was known as a God-fearer. Today we're called Christians. Back then they were called God-fearers, if you want to try to fit in the blank of who they were at that time. They were believers, but they weren't Christians yet, so so to speak. But they were God-fearers, and the Jews would tolerate them. Why? Because, again, they were friendly to the Jews. The Jews didn't let them be a part of their family. They didn't really include them as, as those going to the kingdom of God. But at the same time, they tolerated them and allowed them to be on the outside of the synagogue and to come to the feast from a distance, so to speak, because they said, well, they honor Israel. They honor the God of Israel. Let's not fight against them. Even as today, when you go to Israel with Americans, the Jews do the same thing. You go on a tour. They honor us. They tolerate us. Uh, they allow us to be there. And, and because we bless them. We give to them financially. We pray for them. We support them as a nation. And so it's the same kind of thing that you know, they did then that they even do now. And so there they were at the feast as well. And notice this. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee. And they asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, this creates a problem, in a sense, a struggle for Philip. You see, the Galilee area was a heavily Gentile uh, region. And because of this, Philip being from that region, from Bethsaida, maybe they knew Philip. Maybe they knew Philip was from that region. I don't know. But these Gentiles now go to Philip, who came from a heavily uh, uh, populated Gentile area. And might, again, maybe because they recognized him, maybe because the Lord was preparing Philip for, uh, mentally for later reaching out to the Gentiles, probably both going on to some degree. But either way, they approach him, but it creates a problem for him. Why? Because remember, the Jews taught that God didn't come for the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, the rabbis of that day said that certain people were predestined for heaven and certain people weren't. And Gentiles were all predestined to hell with no possibility of salvation, no possibility of choice, no possibility of hope. So for the Jew to see a Gentile, they said, you're eternally condemned already. Not only am I not going to share the gospel with you or share our good news from our Bible about our God, Abraham, so to speak, but you can't even be a part of what we're doing. Matter of fact, they went so far as to say they were created by God specifically to be tortured eternally. They said they were only created to stoke the fires of hell. Official rabbinic writings say that. And so imagine the problem now. They come to Philip. Philip, um, we want to see Jesus. And Philip's going, uh, we believe in our theological system that you're eternally condemned and predestined to it and there's nothing you can do about it. That's going on in his brain. And yet the Lord is stirring the Gentiles because he knows that's not correct theology and he's going to show them the cross. But Philip has to work through all this in his brain and get it out. This goes back to what we talked about earlier. When our theology doesn't line up with reality, when our theology doesn't line up with the word of God, we have to be the one that changes, not God. And so he's got this battle, and he's going through this battle going, wait a minute, maybe God will save them. Maybe they're not predestined to hell. Maybe they do have a chance. Notice what he does. Look at verse 22. Philip came and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. No doubt he goes to Andrew and says, hey, these Gentiles came to us. Gentiles, yeah, they want to see Jesus. But Gentiles, Gentiles they're, not, they're not even going to heaven. I, well, what do you think? Should we take this to Jesus? Hey, wait a minute, I remember Samaria. Really? Yeah. Remember we went to Samaria? And he reached out to the Samaritans. They were Gentiles. Yeah, but they were kind of half Jew. Yeah, but still, they weren't really Jews. And so maybe, you know, the, what should we do? And so they team up together, probably as buddies, and they decide to go together to Jesus. Maybe this is right. Maybe it's wrong. They're going to go to him. And this isn't the first time that we see Philip and Andrew team up remember the 5,000 and the 5,000 there on the hillside it was Philip that said well we, we can't feed these guys if we had all this money we couldn't feed this huge crowd and Andrew stand there with him grabs some kid's lunch bag probably not really probably I'm sure the kid gave it by by willingly hey well I mean I don't know what this will do but I've got five loaves and two fishes so they'd already gone to Jesus together before to seek him about things. Now they go together again. He's probably running to him saying, you're not going to use some support on this. I don't know. Uh, but either way, 
Um, they want to see what the Lord's going to do with this. And so notice they both go together to see the Lord. And it says, but Jesus answered them. And again, they say, hey, there's these Gentiles that want to see you. So they're expecting the Lord to say something like, uh, well, send them in or tell them not right now or I'll make an appointment. Look at verse 23. But Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. What? That's not what we asked, Lord. We, we said, there's some Gentiles that would like to see you. Now, I'm sure they didn't do that. Don't get me wrong. But it appears that he didn't answer their question at all, and they were probably a little bit befuddled by it. But here's the bottom line. He directly answered their question. How? He was glorified on the cross. And he's saying this, if Gentiles want to see me and Jews as well, they're going to need to look to the cross because that's where you'll see me. That's where I'm glorified. I'm not glorified in theology. I'm not glorified in teaching. Yes, he is glorified in those things to a degree. But to truly know who he is, you've got to look to the cross. And he's making the point to them, although they don't understand it theologically at this point, that's where I'm going to be glorified. The Gentiles will see me. The Gentiles will know me. And in four days, I'll make my world premiere to them and the world by dying on that cross, and I'll be glorified. So that's exactly what, although I'm sure I know they didn't understand it at this point, but that's what he says. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Using an agricultural analogy that they would understand to speak about his picture of him dying and resurrecting, even as you take a seed, plant it in the ground, the seed dies, it sprouts new life and brings forth a crop. He says, the same thing is true of me. I'm going to die. I'm going to be put in the ground, in a tomb, so to speak, for three days and three nights, but my death will be brought back to new life. And because of my new life that springs from my roots of death and and coming back to life and resurrection, there'll be a whole harvest that'll come in with other believers following me. So he's teaching them all this theology about the Gentiles and about how the Jews and the Gentiles will both come, although I'm sure they didn't understand this because they didn't, it says they didn't understand any of it until later. But he says, this is what's going to happen. I have to die. Don't you understand? And look at this, verse 25. He says, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What an amazing statement. What he's saying is simply this. If you seek the things of this world and live for the things of this world only, you're going to be an empty and destitute person at death without anything to show for it. Why? Because you're living for this world. You're living for the things of this world. They're going to pass away. It'll never fulfill you. It will never make you happy. Yes, there are things that can temporarily satisfy, but nothing will satisfy the deepest heart of man and nothing will satisfy eternally but giving your life to Jesus Christ. He said, you've got to die to yourself, lay yourself down, and then die to yourself and live for me. If you do that, you'll find true life because true life is in the spirit. It's interesting. A lot of people say, well, I don't know if I believe in the spirit realm. Really, the spirit realm is more of what reality is. That's really what reality is, the spirit realm. We're just an outcropping from that as God created us and brought us into being. And so lay your life down, he's saying. You do that, you're going to find hope and you're going to find life. Are you empty this morning and trying to find hope in life and you can't find it? It's because you're living for yourself. You know, the whole thing, you know, go out and find yourself. You know, this whatever. Whenever you do that, you're always going to come back empty. And I don't mean that to offend anybody personally, but that's not where the answer is. The answer is not within. The answer is without, and it's Jesus Christ. He said, unless you die, quit chasing your dreams and do for me. Die for my sake. Let me give you the dreams that I created you to walk in. That's when true joy and fulfillment will come. You have to lay it all down or you're never going to understand what true life is. Uh, Even though God, again, has given us all things richly to enjoy, that's a byproduct of walking in fullness of Him. You will keep it for eternal life if we lay everything on the altar for Him. The Gospel of John is home to one of the most well-known verses ever, John 3.16. It gives you the message of hope right there in one sentence. God sent His Son to save the world. But the next verse, verse 17, is also significant. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Pastor Mark has something to say about this, too. Yes, Greg, I think you need to know that your life isn't a surprise to Jesus. Maybe you've been feeling like you're too far down the wrong path to turn around, or maybe you're afraid God's going to punish you for all you've done. That verse is there to give you hope. God didn't send Jesus to condemn you. In fact, Jesus' death on the cross forgives all your mistakes and failures. He's enough. And all you need to do is come to Him and hand over your sin. Would you like to talk to someone about this? Please call us. We'd love to hear from you. Our number is 865-609-1385 or reach out to us through the About Us section on PastorMarkKirk.com. Never forget that His mercies are new every morning. And I'm excited you're ready to start a new life today and know that I'm praying for you. 
Thanks, Pastor Mark. And with that, we're out of time. But Pastor Mark has more verses to share with us from the book of John. So make sure to join us the next time we come to the table. to the table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville